and then we'll figure out where to post. Thanks, Dr. Wayne. Uh, we have Sorry, a YouTube page. Uh, finishing lunch, so didn't want to. <laughs> no, please, please eat. It's important. Um, where are you based? Uh, psychiatry. Excellent. With with Mandel. Wonderful. Uh, Megan, we have a YouTube page, so we can post it there. Oh, yeah. Look at us. Awesome sauce. Trying to remember, W comes after V. Yeah. I know my alphabet, sort of. It's one of those things where you can only start in certain places and keep going. Right? right? When I get Unless to the you end, know I'm like, I have to, say, I, have, I have to sing it to myself. I have to sing the end of it. Yeah, I and can start I'm... at A, I can start at L, a couple different places. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. Oh man. Start taking tablets. Hey Amanda. Hi Megan. Hi everyone. Hi Amanda. Hi Kate. It's nice to meet you. Kate is our certificate coordinator. Nice to finally see a face. Indeed. I still have to figure out how to put on like elevator music <laughs> when we're waiting for meetings <laughs> to start. Excellent. in slideshow mode there we go welcome everybody it's 201 p.m uh, my name is megan lanefall i'm the executive director of the pen implementation science center and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to a session that we're having about educational opportunities in implementation science we are recording this session so don't feel like you have to take detailed notes and we're also happy to make the slides available We'll be posting all the content in a place that's publicly accessible. And Izzy, our um, fabulous coordinator, is going to make sure that that information is available to everybody. And if you want to share it, feel free to share it. So I'm going to present a little bit on some implementation research training opportunities. Um, but I'm happy to be joined by our Director of Acute Care Implementation Research, Amanda Betancourt, who's going to tell us about some of the work that she's doing on implementation um, practice capacity building. Um, Amanda, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Megan. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Betancourt. I'm an assistant professor in the Penn Nursing School. I'm a pediatric clinical nurse specialist and an implementation scientist. And I'll tell you a little more about my um, implementation practice training experience when I do my part of the talk. Nice to see you all today. Thank you so much, Amanda. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. All right. Izzy, can you confirm for me that you can see full screen slides? Yes, I can. Okay. I don't know if this is the right title. I think it was something like this. <laughs> but basically, we want to tell you guys all about um, educational and training opportunities in MSI. So you have already met your speakers. Let's see. There we go. 
you've met your speakers. Um, here we are, we will talk to you. We have a couple of objectives for today's talk to review some competencies in implementation science and then to explain training and educational opportunities in implementation research and practice. By way of a roadmap, I'm going to talk about IMSI and IMP research competencies and opportunities for 15 ish minutes. And then Amanda will talk about learnings from implementation practice training and capacity building for the, about the same amount of time. And then we wanted to leave plenty of opportunity for questions and answers. So um, please get your questions ready. Feel free to put them in the chat whenever. And then we can also come back to them when Amanda and I are done with our uh, prepared remarks. So I realize that there are um, a variety of people here and a variety of people that might listen to this presentation. So I figured it would be useful just briefly to define implementation science. Um, there are some classic definitions that come from the National Institutes of Health and that you can also find in the flagship journal implementation science. My favorite definition actually comes from someone named Ann Sales, who's a scholar at the University of Missouri um, and one of the sort of founding parents of implementation science with a background in nursing and economics. She first defines implementation as planned human behavior change under organizational constraints. And she defines implementation science as the study of implementation applied to health services. So that's really how I think about implementation science is that we're trying to achieve behavior change within the context of um, often organizations. So that means it's it can be individual behavior change, it can be organizational behavior change, it could even actually be societal behavior change, but it's sort of within the constraints of some sort of structure. So there are a few related definitions that's probably important to understand here. We talk a lot about implementation science, but implementation science, according to the NIH, is sort of an umbrella term that covers a few different things. The two that we are going to talk about today are implementation research and implementation practice. And then there's also the science of dissemination, which the NIH sees as part of implementation science. And when you look at the breadth of research in this space, you'll see there's a smaller amount that's focused on dissemination, um, science, research, and practice, and then a bigger part that's focused on, on implementation. Dissemination is the active spread of information that needs to be known in order to facilitate the uptake of um, efficacious practices, and then implementation is actually making people and systems do that work. So what does an implementation specialist, either a researcher or a practitioner, do? Um, I think there are probably a few ways to think about this, but this is how I think about it, is that part of the work of an implementation specialist is to diagnose problems with behavior, gaps in performance, and those gaps are related to a failure to take up and use evidence. Or on the flip side, if you think about de-implementation, which is also an important part of what we do, um, we want to diagnose performance gaps related to continuing to use things that do not work, either using them too much or using them in inappropriate settings. Um, you can do all of your work just on the diagnosis piece and just on understanding context and what contextual factors lead to performance gaps, but often most of us were focused on actually changing and addressing those gaps by um, prescribing implementation strategies. And it's not truly a prescription. You know, I'm a physician. I would love to write a prescription for do this thing more often. <laughs> it does not work that way. But the idea is that once you know what the gaps are, you can then come up with behavioral interventions, which we call implementation strategies, to narrow those performance gaps. And those are often applied at multiple levels of the social ecological model. So that's what we mean by multi-level. So you're thinking about strategies that can be applied to individuals, potentially teams, organizations, systems, uh, that sort of idea. We also evaluate our implementation efforts using qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods. And then specifically for researchers, um, we are also focused on developing and testing methodologies to advance the whole thing, to figure out new and innovative and um, rigorous ways to do the work that I just described. Competencies in implementation science relate to all of those things that I just described. So there is some knowledge, there are some knowledge pieces and skills pieces related to just implementation science itself. So what does all the terminology mean? All of the theories, models, and frameworks that some of you may have, have some awareness of, that falls into this bucket, but all the things that, that relate to implementation science as a field. But then there's a lot of other things too, right? Implementation science is a pretty broad, um, it's a multidisciplinary, multi-professional field that draws from psychology, sociology, anthropology, management science, org theory, um, program evaluation, public health. And so having a, having 
uh, competency in those different domains is very, very useful as you do implementation science. And then there's just some basic, like how to be an academic, if you're gonna be a scientist, like how do you write? How do you communicate? How do you get a grant? Um, how do you teach people? So all of these competencies can, can fall into implementation science. So if you're interested in learning more, there are a lot of training opportunities in implementation science. And I wanna take you through a few of them just to give you a flavor for what, um, what this might look like. I think of it in three big buckets, although I don't know that these are necessarily all inclusive and I'm happy to talk about that if you guys wanna have a discussion about the different ways to train. But I think about a la carte courses where you're sort of picking out individual pieces of training that fill in gaps for you. I think about credential granting programs where there is a program, a circumscribed program that is teaching you something about implementation science. And then there's an apprentice model where you're working on a project or you're working with people and you're sort of learning as you go, uh, which, which um, what to do, how to think about things. Before you do that though, like before you decide, do I wanna do any training in implementation science? And if I do, what kind of training do I wanna do in implementation science? I think it's important to ask yourself a few questions. So the first question, is where am I in my career? Are you early stage? Are you a graduate student? Are you a postdoc? Are you faculty? Where are you? Um, how much mentorship do you need? Are you someone who has a lot of skills and you have you know, this one little thing that you wanna learn, but you otherwise are you know, fully capable of conceiving, executing a research project, coming up with funds to do it, and you just need to plug in a little bit of skill here? or you're really sort of at the beginning and you're trying to understand where you fit in this field and you may be building an entire program of research that, that's based in implementation science. If you're, if you're filling in a skill, something like an a la carte course makes a lot of sense, right? If you already know all the analytic tools that you need and you just wanna understand like, oh, how do these frameworks relate to what I'm interested in? Then a course might make a lot of sense. But if you're at the very beginning of your career and you're like, how do I write a paper? <laughs> like you might need a program, right? You might need a whole program to help you figure out, you know, all the all the things, all those skills that we talked about. Um, and then, does it make sense to learn a new skill? So this, I think, especially of folks that are more established in research, um, and it doesn't have to be a faculty member, but I'm sort of thinking of a mid-career faculty member who's been writing papers. Maybe they've been getting grants. They have their own area of focus, and they say, "Oh, implementation science. This sounds great." This can you know, move my program to the next level. It's really important to think, are you gonna do it? Do you need to do it? Do you wanna do it? Or is this something where you need just really capable partners and you're gonna partner with them to do really exciting work? And a parallel for me here is um, I partner with a human factors engineer. Um, her name's Ellen Bass, she's at Drexel. She has expertise in systems engineering too. I love engineering. I love so many things about it. And I, I had to think to myself like, do I, do I need to be a human factors engineer? Probably not, that probably doesn't make sense, right? I'm gonna work with someone who's wicked smart in that area and I bring my imp side to the table, she brings her engineering to the table and we have fun working with each other, right? But she's not necessarily gonna go get a master's degree in implementation science and I'm not gonna do that in engineering. Next question is how much do you know already? So if you, again, can identify specific gaps, just fill those in, but if you feel like you need a broad, um, understanding of how theory works, then that might lead you more toward an organized program. Do you need a credential? Do you need letters after your name? This is a broader philosophical discussion that's probably outside the scope of this conversation, but I do, I think about a conversation that I have probably every 18 to 24 months with Judy Shea, who's one of the faculty members in the School of Medicine, because I keep asking Judy if I should get a PhD. <laughs> and she's like, what are you what are you not able to do that you would be able to do with a PhD? And I'm like, nothing. And she's like, well, you probably shouldn't get a PhD. I don't know. I go, okay. And then and then I keep coming back to it. But if if there are things that you can't do without the credential, then maybe you get it. But if really it's just letters, maybe you don't need more letters. And maybe that might push you more toward an a la carte course as opposed to a specific program. Another question I ask is is something being made more difficult because you lack a credential? And this is a little bit more nebulous, but if it would be a lot easier for you to do your work with a certain credential, it might be um, worth thinking about. 
thinking about that question. Jen, that's so funny. Jen keeps asking the same question. Um, next point, what resources do I have available to me? And here I'm thinking of financial resources, but you can also think about time. Um, and can someone else pay for it? So is there a way that you can get either an institution or a program to pay for the training? Um, the cost is certainly a very real consideration. And then how self-directed are you? Some folks do much better when they're in a program where there's deadlines and homework and accountability. And it's not to say that one way is better than another, but if you know that about yourself, that you're gonna do better in a program, then maybe you go more toward a program. Whereas if you, all, all you need is a list of objectives and you can go, then you could learn quite a lot with asynchronous content that's delivered on the web. Like there's so much that's out there and we'll show you some of the stuff that's out there. If you're self-directed, you could, you could get a lot of your needs met based on what's already available. So a la carte courses, I'm gonna take you briefly through the three, um, or I'm not gonna talk so much about apprenticeship, but I'll talk about a la carte courses and credential granting programs. There are some pros of a la carte courses. One is scheduling, right? You can sort of pick the ones that fit your schedule. The cost can be um, easier to manage because it's just one course and sometimes they're expensive. Um, and then there's uh, just in time learning, right? You get to plug in those, those gaps that you have. I see Laura Ellen made a point about opportunity cost. I agree, there is, there is opportunity cost. Let's come back to that in the q and I'd love to talk more about that. In terms of cons, um, if you take courses one at a time, you might miss the big picture, right? So if there is a, what does implementation science mean? What can it do for me? How can it advance my agenda? How do I think about how all these different disciplines fit together? You're probably not gonna get that in an a la carte course, right? So you might be missing that. Um, you don't get a credential. So if you needed one, if you need those letters, then you don't get that. Um, and then they tend to be limited time. And we, I experienced this. So I teach in the Implementation Science Institute, which is four days long. And we'll talk a little bit about the Institute but also in our introductory implementation science course, it's a semester long. And even just looking at those, which you could both, you could think about both of them as a la carte courses, but just thinking about the amount of time that people have to think and sort of marinate, if I can use that word in the ideas, is very different, right? And people who take the four day course are like, it's like drinking from a fire hose, it's too much. And then people who have a whole semester engage with the material in a much different way you could extend that to a whole program, a whole credential, um, a credential granting program, where if you have multiple semesters to think about the concepts, to let them develop, to re-engage with them, you may um, get more out of it potentially than if you have just a limited amount of time. Some examples of a la carte courses at Penn that we offer are the Implementation Science Institute, which I'll show you more about in the next slide, and then our introductory courses that come through the MSHP program. So HPR, it was listed this semester as 6110. It's about to change to 6100, but basically it's the introductory implementation science course that I have co-directed with Danielle Cullen. Um, she's gonna be co she's gonna be directing it on her own starting in fall 23. And then HPR 6, uh, 6120, which is advanced topics and implementation science, which is a summer course. And then there are some external courses that we'll show you later. This is the Implementation Science Institute. This will be our seventh year giving it. So it's a four day long, um, four half day long virtual uh, course that is meant to be an overview of implementation science. You can see all the topics that we cover. It's kind of all the things, but it's really rapid fire. So it's meant to be a survey overview of the field, um, but it, if you want to be an implementation scientist, it's probably not enough. And every year we have a couple of people who go, wait, I need to know more. And then they enroll in the courses. Um, but, but I think for folks who want to know what implementation science is and does it fit into your overall program, it's a nice sort of bite-size introduction. Um, the timing seems to work well for people. So it's five hours a day. So you can still do like morning clinic potentially. Um, and then for the West Coast people, it works well. Uh, this coming um, 2023, it'll be from June 6th to June 9th. And you can see we have three keynote speakers, including Renad Betis, who's the uh, former director of PICE at LDI. Um, credential granting programs. So pros are, hey, you get letters. <laughs> I guess that's good. Um, it's also a coherent program of study. So it can give you kind of a broader overview of implementation science that, that um, may make you feel like you have a more well-rounded understanding. 
they do cost money. The one at um, Penn, which I'll show you on the next slide, is four credit units. And right now, a credit unit at Penn is just north of $6,000. So a four credit unit program at Penn is $24,000, or a little bit more than that, right? So that's not insignificant. There is a time commitment that's involved, and then scheduling, figuring out whether all the classes fit where you need them to fit. Some examples are the MSI certificate I'll show you, and then there are some external programs. So here's our implementation science certificate. Kate O'Boyle is on the call. She's our coordinator for this. This is a brand new certificate that we just started in fall 2022. That's a four credit unit program um, that will give you more well-rounded content and implementation science. So that's it for what I wanted to say about Penn's offerings. There are external institutions with very strong MSI training programs. Um, Izzy has collected, has compiled a list of them that we'll make available to you. I didn't want to go through them in detail because it's kind of a lot, um, but these are the institutions that have um, that seem to have the most robust offerings. I can tell you they're all great. I have taken some of the courses from UCSF. They're phenomenal, but you know all of these pro all of these institutions have very strong MSI programs. So I would say look to see what matches your budget, your schedule, your interest, and kind of go with that. I, I would not necessarily say that one of these is better than another. If you are self-directed, there's a lot of really good content on the web. I've only listed a couple here. The NIH has a lot of programming, specifically the National Cancer Institute. There's also TITER, um, the Training Institute for Research and Implementation. Oh, I don't know what it stands for. It's T-I-D-I-R-H. Um, it used to be a course, but they stopped running the course, but they took all the content and put it on the web. So you can find that. The VA has great uh, programming and WashU also has some um, content, as does the University of Washington, by the way. So there's lots of great content out there. There are some master's programs that I want to show. Oh, Izzy put, put together some stuff too. Thank you. Or Izzy is pointing that ISC3 put some stuff together in the chat. Um, there are master's programs in implementation science. We do not have one of those at Penn. I don't know if we're going that direction. Don't ask me. I don't. I don't know yet. We're just we're working on the certificate right now. <laughs> and then there are PhD programs. Um, oh, and Laura Ellen says the facilitation course is free if you have a VA affiliation. Great, thank you. There are actually PhD programs in implementation science. There are not a lot of them. I think there will be more to come. Um, but that's if you're if you're really really drunk, the Kool Aid have fallen in and potentially drowned. There are uh, PhD programs. So I am going to transition now to um, Amanda Betancourt. The most of the stuff that I talked about before in terms of training focuses on implementation research, implementation practice applies what we know um, about implementation to real time improvement. This is my sort of high level definition, but I'm sure Amanda will have a lot more to say. Um, and then I'm going to stop there and hand things over to Amanda. Thanks, Megan. Let me go ahead and share my slides here. <clears throat> hey, Izzy or Megan, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see those? Okay. Looks good. Oh, perfect. Awesome. So um, thanks, Megan. Uh, kind of teed up a few things I was going to talk about, so I appreciate that first part of the talk today. So really what I'm going to talk about is implementation practice training for clinicians. Um, I titled this Educational Options and Opportunities because I think truthfully as a field, we're not really there yet on what implementation practice training education should look like. But today I'm going to talk about um, a sort of demonstration project I did, what we learned from that, and tie it to what the literature says about implementation practice and maybe where we need to go in the future. In case it's something that's interesting to you, you can learn kind of where we are and what your options are. Um, in the vein of learning about education, I just thought I'd share my training, just so you can see how a person like me ends up doing the things I do now. Um, I finished my PhD at Penn in 2019 in health services research. Um, and then I was super fortunate to be able to go to Michigan um, and an NHLBI sponsored K-12 program in critical care implementation science, um, where Ann Sales, a person Megan mentioned earlier, was one of my mentors. I also was part of the National Clinician Scholars Program in Michigan. Um, and then when I was a PhD student, I took Megan and Renat's um, course in implementation science. I also did the Institute. So I've kind of taken baby steps into it and then a deep dive as a postdoc. Um, but truthfully, I have been an implementer of evidence-based practices clinically since about 2008 as a nurse and in many different roles. So my um, slant on implementation research is very much informed by implementation practice. Um, and it helps me see some gaps in the way that we train clinicians in 
evidence translation. And that to me is a really interesting opportunity. So Megan went through this a little bit, but just to kind of reiterate, you know, implementation scientists research the ways to implement evidence. And our research informs many aspects of practical implementation. We develop models, theories, we make toolkits, we make playbooks, we try to find generalizable implementation interventions that will work regardless of setting. But there's this whole other piece of leveraging implementation science, which is much more practical, which is how do you use those theories, models, and frameworks in a real-life clinical setting when you're trying to change practice? And so for me, that's what I did for a long time before I came to understand the field of implementation science. Um, and, you know, looking for places that have sort of semi-figured this out, um, I'll point you to the Center for Implementation.com. It's a Health Canada um, initiative. There's a website with lots of information. Um, and so, really most of the evidence I can find around this comes from them. Um, and so implementation practice is a little bit more of a skill set, you know, something to put in your toolbox when you're trying to change things versus a science focus, science research grant, generalizable knowledge focus, if that helps at all. So I'm going to talk about a project I did and not as much as I'm going to talk about how it worked, but <laughs> broadly speaking, um, this one had, this project had surprise funding. So I, I kind of like put the cart before the horse a little on this one, but I am learning a lot from it about how to train nurses specifically in implementation practice. So forever I've had this idea that partnered research between an implementation scientist and a health system that wants to change outcomes for patients could be a really powerful strategy to drive change. And I made this horrible conceptual model when I was an NCSP scholar in my postdoc, but honestly, you know, the way I'm thinking about this has held true through this project. So while this looks really messy, the idea is it's almost like a CBPR partnership I formed with a health system that actually is struggling with implement, implementing evidence. And the clinicians were frustrated and looking for a solution. So it was that perfect opportunity meets competence time. And I was like, this is really interesting. Let's just see what happens. So we did that. I did a talk there um, about implementation science, and I called it what I wish I knew about implementation science when I was implementing things. And honestly, a person was there, a private donor who gave a lot of money to the hospital to then say, hey, why don't you train some people in this? Because if you wish you would have known about it, maybe other people in this hospital would have liked to have known about it too. So it was very interesting and, you know, serendipitous sort of effect of this talk. But what I noticed is that it's true, not just what I observed in my practice, but true of probably all clinicians working in healthcare settings is we really don't have training in how to change practice with an implementation science lens. We have lots of things we know about human factors, quality improvement, improvement science, like all these things have been sort of woven maybe throughout our training, but like not concertedly effort on the change process and how science can guide it. So this health system is in Virginia. You might be familiar with it. It's called INOVA. Um, it's a very large system. It's got 19,000 employees, 2 million patient visits, and five hospitals. And so what we did was we recruited a cohort of 40 nurses um, across all of those hospitals and systems. And they're everything from like critical care to uh, mental behavioral health, there's a rehab center in there, so all kinds of different clinical settings. Um, and then we had a lot of meetings for a long time to set up <laughs> what this cohort of nurses was going to look like, what are they going to learn, and how are we going to integrate them into the system after they learn some things about implementation practice. Um, so really, their driving question for this partnership and the reason they wanted implementation practice training for nurses is because they have in invested probably excess of a million dollars in quality improvement projects that nurses are doing that are having some effect, but then that effect is rarely sustained and it, they're having problems scaling and spreading it across the system. So for them, there was a, a no-brainer. Like, hey, if we can learn how to do this better, we're going to save money. Um, and so <laughs> we spent a lot of time, probably four months planning this um, and uh, choosing the 40 nurses, then the pandemic happened. So we had to hit the pause button for a little bit. Um, so we actually didn't start this until the beginning of 2021. So last year, and we completed all of our education over the course of about 10 months um, and ended in last December, about a year ago today. Um, so the first publication from that is in press. It's if you're thinking about how to integrate people who know things about implementation science throughout a health system, this paper describes why the sort of why it's important, how did they structure it, how they get funding, and how are they thinking of using these people throughout the system should be you know published soon. It's in press now. Um, 
but really fascinating partnership, which is a whole other talk. But just so you know, that's why that this actually happened. And this is the, their model that's going to be in the paper um, that basically just describes how all of the councils of nurses that work on changing practice, there will be implementation science specialists, nurses, embedded across all the councils so that when they try to change practice, it's informed by implementation science. So they're sort of internal consultants, if you will. So for me, super cool idea. My opportunity was, well, what content are we going to teach them? <laughs> because there's really not a cookbook, not a blueprint for how to teach content, especially to nurses in a clin or clinicians, right, in a setting. And um, so we basically designed this educational content around co-creating both things I thought that were important as a scientist and nurse and implementer for so many years and outcomes that this system wanted to achieve from this particular intervention. So we ended up doing 12 modules. They were each two hours long. They were all virtual because it was pandemic time. And of all those modules, one hour of each one at least was a small group facilitated by me going around in the Zoom virtual world and doing activities related to the lecture. So it was not purely didactic. There was no homework. There was no other facilitation. It was just these 12, so 24 hours-ish of, of content. Um, and uh, the nurses that participated, many of them had done quality improvement work before or evidence-based practice work before, but almost all of them had been frustrated or annoyed by it because it was a lot of effort and they hadn't seen the effect that they wanted to see with their patients. So these are the learning objectives that we came up with together. Um, and again, as, as Megan mentioned, I'm happy to make these slides available to you if it's helpful. Um, but you can see if you just kind of scan them, if you know anything about implementation science, it's like identifying a gap, understanding stakeholders, how to process map, how to choose a strategy, and what, how to theory model and framework sort of fit into those things. But with a very practical bent, we took an evidence-based practice they wanted to initiate called Molar the Marrier, which is a um, non-ventilator associated pneumonia evidence-based practice bundle. And we workshopped it through this entire thing, just again, to keep it real practical, real accessible. This, imagine you're doing this thing, this is how this applies to this project. Um, and so it, the sessions went really well. I was constantly impressed with how much they really did retain and apply in those group practice settings. Um, and this is sort of like how the activities went. Again, lots of words here, happy to share this later, but this was the content that I just sort of developed based on what they wanted and what I thought was important from some of the regular implementation science competencies we have for scientists. And really the big thing that I think they took away from this is how to make a logic model that looks like implementation mapping with determinants from a framework, the strategies, only choosing strategies that map to determinants, you know, barriers and facilitators for a project, and being clear on outcomes and the mechanism for how that strategy works. And really, I basically led the whole class towards this endpoint and thought, hey, listen, you know, if, if the nurses who are working on these projects could make one of these for each of their projects, they're already light years ahead of where they were before in practicing implementation with these evidence-based practice problems. So we did that. I thought it went well, but certainly we had to ask all the participants, what did they think? And so, um, you know, we were really kind of at a loss for how to me measure this, because as I mentioned, it sort of started and then the funding came. It wasn't like a planned project where I could plan like pre-post and things like that. So I kind of had to squeeze in implement evaluation measures after the fact. But we used the acceptability, feasibility, and appropriateness measures in a survey um, and the reference for those if you're not familiar are here and then we also found implementation practice competencies from that Canadian group um, that we're looking at the data from so just to show you from the acceptability feasibility and appropriateness how did like nurses feel about this training did they think this is what they need for them and their practice and their work and you know kind of a I mean I was really kind of blown away by this we had like a 95 percent response rate out of 40 participants for this survey and a hundred percent of them said it was appropriate like nurses need to know this for their work and then if you look at feasibility there's a little bit of a signal that people might think it's a little bit not that easy to do but overwhelmingly positive and then acceptability same thing like this is definitely the right thing for us right now everyone's neutral or really really positive about it which you know hey, I don't think I've ever had for a nursing educational initiative before. So we were all really excited. And then I took a little bit of a deeper dive on feasibility and because there was a bit of a signal that some people felt differently about that. And I think what you see here is the nurses felt totally doable because they had just finished it, right? So they're like, yeah, of course we can do this. But was it easy to do? Maybe not. I think they appreciate that like, 
giving nurses time away from patient care is a hard, not exactly the easiest thing to do. Um, so that's what the signal sort of shows here, but really positive. Nurses were saying like, this is what I needed all my life. Where were you? I need this training. Um, so then going to those implementation practice competencies from the Canadian group, um, I was not aware of these, but one of the other people from the site found it online and was like, hey, can we use these to, to measure competencies? Um, and I was like, sure, let's see what it says. So it comes from the Practicing Knowledge Translation Project um, that was mentioned earlier by Moore and others. Um, and so <clears throat> in this paper that's linked here, you can see their, their sort of questionnaire and all the things that went into to evaluating these competencies for implementation practice. But the caveats about this tool is that it was used um, in a much more intensive and different setting than what I was doing with the nurses in this hospital. So they had like 20 people, international audience, they applied to be in the program. Um, they had a three-day full immersion plus 11 virtual sessions and three to five hours per person per week of one-to-one -one facilitation. So this is like, I don't know what category Megan was putting things in, but this is like you are card carrying credentialing and have nothing else to do with your time besides implementation science for a while. So while I respect this study completely and I understand what they were trying to do, the reality of most clinical people's lives is most clinicians don't have that kind of time. So we're, we did use this to evaluate competencies. However, I'm not sure it was the right tool for our project. And there probably isn't one because we didn't do something this intensive because it's just not practical for nurses in a clinical setting. So these are their practice core competencies. Um, and it's like how to develop a evidence-based project how to implement it, how to evaluate it. They also had dissemination in there, which I thought was interesting from a practical standpoint. I'm still struggling to see how that's important, but you know, could be depending on the role of the person. Um, and also one of the things from that paper and that tool is that most of the people who went through the implementation science practice training had more than 10 years of experience, were in a leadership role. They weren't clear about what clinical role they had, but less than half of them were actually clinicians. Um, the rest were policy people. So again, it's hard to know if it's really, what is practice um, for, for a clinician versus a policymaker? Those things are very probably different. Um, but really these competencies resonate with me for sure. But I think um, how important each one of them are to what different clinicians need to know to practice implementation um, are probably different. These are their results. Um, and, you know, they looked at knowledge and self-efficacy. So do I know more about this? And then do I feel like I can actually do it? And they measured it throughout their year long, very intensive training program. <laughs> and I guess, thankfully for them, those numbers seem to trend upward as the year <laughs> goes on. However, they did publish in the paper their attendance in these sessions, and it does significantly drop off about halfway through the year. <laughs> so I'm not sure what that means. Um, we didn't experience that in, in our training session. But it sort of points to this idea, which I'll talk about in a second, of like, how much training do people really need? And what is too much? <laughs> and like in the era where we don't have extra time, clinicians should be doing clinical things as much as possible, right? And so, you know, what's the value add for this? But broadly speaking, they found good results and an increase in all of these competencies over their year-long training program in both knowledge and self-efficacy. So it was an effective program. I didn't, I went ahead and just crosswalked what they think is important and what we actually did in, in the project I did. And there's just check marks by everything. Basically, we did the same concepts, right? I trained them the same concepts as they did. They just did a whole lot more of it, I think, than I did in the sessions. So um, of, the, of the competencies, designing an evidence-based program, actually doing the implementation I, we did in, in the INOVA program, um, evaluating whether a project has been successful or not. We also did looking at sustainability, scale, and spread. We also did context, you know, how do you adapt this to your specific project area or content area we did. And we talked a lot about stakeholder engagement, especially for nurses, because there's not a lot of formal authority among nurses. So how do you get people to buy into a project that you're driving when they may not have to? Um, but one other competency they had was dissemination. I didn't touch on that in the um, program that we did. So, you know, I share all that with you because basically I think these, the evidence base for what 
implementation specialist practitioners need to learn is pretty small. Um, I'm trying to help contribute to that with this project and some other things I'm working on, but really we don't know a lot about what people need. You know, I think there's a real um, opportunity to look at whether you need one-to-one -one facilitation, like mentorshipy apprenticeship type models for clinicians. I did not do that. I did some short visiting around small groups, but they definitely learned a lot on their own. Um, what's the dose and duration of content for people who are practicing clinicians, right? Not saying that other people don't need to learn how to practice, but in my world, I'm a clinician. I think that's a place where we need to learn some things. And so how much time do they need to spend to be good at, enough at this that it'll make an impact on the projects? Um, where and when should this knowledge be acquired? You know, Megan mentioned you could be at any point in your in your training life right now at this talk, and you might want to learn about implementation science. So what's the right time? And, and depending on what time you're in, how much training do you need? Um, I don't think we know. And certainly those training opportunities for earlier stage, these are registered nurses that went through this program. So they've not been to graduate school. They don't have PhDs. They don't have certificates. They don't have any of that. Um, but, but they very much consumed and applied this knowledge appropriately without those things. So really interesting to me. Um, and then does this actually make a project more sustainable? Does this actually affect an outcome that we care about, right? We still don't know, hopefully, some of these projects and, and INOVA will, but we don't know. And then I had this random thought that I just put here for us to think about if you want when we do Q&A is, is the objective when we teach clinicians, if you're a clinician and you want to learn about implementation science, is it because you want to start a new project from scratch and you want to make sure implementation science has inform that project? Or have you already started something and it's not going well um, and you want to rescue that project or you want to redo that project or you want to kind of like figure out where you went wrong? I think those are both important things for people who want to practice implementation science to think about. And I'm not sure. I feel like most of the time for nurses anyway, it's rescuing a project or <laughs> redoing a project or um, a, tailoring a project differently <laughs> depending on settings. Um, and I don't, we don't have core competencies and curriculum for, for healthcare clinicians and applied implementation practice. I think a lot of us are um, trying to find those and, and looking towards them. I, for me, it wasn't as clear to me that there aren't as many papers about this until I just sort of stumbled into this project and tried to put things together and realized there's not a lot out there. Um, but this is a really important area because I hear a lot from people who come to training things that I'm able to work on, like facilitate as faculty, hoping to just learn how to apply implementation science, not hoping to write a grant or be an implementation scientist. So I think there's a really important gap here that that has yet to be addressed. Um, and by what the nurses, at least from INOVA said, they really enjoyed it. They found it appropriate. They can see ways to apply it. And they didn't drop out. They were super engaged and, and felt the content was really helpful. So I wish I could tell you there's like a practical place to go and learn right now if you want to learn about implementation science practice. Um, there's not as much out there, um, but certainly um, it's a place where the field is wide open for the future. And I think it's it's a gap that can easily be filled with people maybe like me and others who kind of have this practical background but are also implementation scientists. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my slides. And I think we're doing Q&A now, right, Megan? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Betancourt. All right. You all have been armed with knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Ashcraft, for the applause. <laughs> <laughs> what questions can we answer for you? Or what what comments do you have? What this is this is your time. Hey. hey, everyone. Hey, um, I'm Arielle Williamson. I'm a chop based pen faculty. Um, thanks so much for this great talk. Also really appreciate all the resources um, in the chat. That's awesome. Um, I think maybe it's just me that is feeling this way, but sometimes, not. <laughs> hopefully not, um, but I, it's okay if it is. Um, but sometimes, I mean, I feel as though like I've done courses, you know, I have done targeted, you know, K mentorship in implementation science. And it, 
of course, I want to collaborate and do team science, but I think there's sometimes it's hard to know, like, do I need a certificate to make sure people know that, like, I have done the training or I know I, I, I think I know what I'm talking about. Like I always try to include an implementation science consultant, but I think especially for early career people who maybe have had this training, like I've attended the institutes, taken the advanced course, done online training, gotten mentorship. And it sometimes still is like, well, you know, you can say that, but it, you may, people may not perceive you as being ready. And so I just wonder too about, I don't know, maybe this is less of a question. I'm just like, what certificate is there? Okay. Alexa just asked this to Megan earlier this week. So it's me and Alexa and of two, um, but <laughs> super representative. No, but I think I'm going to stop talking. So you experts can, but I think it's like, sometimes I just wonder like, do I need to join something or, or it may be just in the, the track record that you accumulate of leading projects and publications with that. But I do think that that's some, some common feedback sometimes in like grant related submissions or um, other proposals is what I'll say. And just any thoughts on that? So I think you, you actually hit on it sorry, near the end of your comments, which is, it's the track record, I think, that's more important than anything else. And I see Jen Myers, I'm not going to call her out, but I'm thinking of, I think implementation science is where QI was maybe 10 to 15 years ago in terms of the importance of a credential. That you'll see that there are a lot of folks in the field that don't have a credential, right? They learned doing something else, they established themselves in public health or psychology or management or something else, and then they're doing implementation science and every He's like, okay, great, you're an expert. And then there's another cohort of people that come through that have a credential. Sorry, hold on. I hope I didn't get infected with something at the DNI meeting. We'll see. I also hope that for you. Yeah. So we'll see. Thoughts. Um, <clears throat> but um, I think we're in this sweet spot, right? So you don't have to have a credential. Nobody's going to not give you a grant because you don't have a credential. But what they are going to look for is experience. And so one of the approaches that I've seen be successful is you either as a K applicant or maybe an R applicant say, I have expertise in implementation science as evidenced by this coursework, potentially. Yeah. Here's a couple of papers. And I also have an implementation scientist on my grant for a small amount of effort that I can go to if I run into something that's hairy, right? So maybe you're on the grant for a bunch of effort and then you have somebody on for two and a half or five percent because you can handle 95 percent of the things but if you run into something sticky you've got somebody in your back pocket who's not a mentor right because you're ready to go if it's an r but it's a collaborator who maybe has expertise in implementation mapping or something like that like i've got an r01 where i'm applying i'm the implementation scientist right but i put renad betas on it too because i'm like well i haven't done a lot of implementation mapping so she's going to be on there for a little bit of effort to help me out with that so that's kind of how i how i put it together but jen i just saw you pop on do you want to say something that's really helpful. Thank you. And I appreciate the comments in the chat too. Um, no, just great talk, Megan and Amanda. Um, hi, everyone. I uh, lead quality improvement on patient safety education at Penn and have collaborated with Megan for years. And we often have uh, people, learners in our program are thinking about taking our program and aren't sure if they need it. So these questions really resonate with me. Um, you know, and, and someone, you know, told me once you, you really get more education for two reasons. One, you feel like you, you need it, right, to get your next job, move up that professional ladder that you aspire to, or you want it. Like I, I was just on a, a call with some of our students and, and um, uh, was just blown away by them saying like how they are now seeing everything that they do in quality improvement work um, with a new lens. Um, I also see the question here in the chat about um, how implementation practice education fits with quality improvement training. And Megan and I talk a, a lot about this. It's really just a spectrum. And I think, you know, a core question to ask yourself is how academic do I want to be? Do I want to be studying the how and the why and, and writing the papers and coming up with those research questions and starting to answer them? Um, or are you um, more on the, the implementation side 
but thanks for having me. This is uh, really thought-provoking. Yeah, I think those are great considerations. And, you know, the QI implementation science thing, every time I'm asked that question, I give a different answer. I will say there's something at the intersection, which I think of as improvement science, which really includes both. And I think decisions about where to get additional training in that area may have a lot to do with the institution that you're at and what you have available to you. And that at institution A, you might go more down, down an implementation science road and at institution B, you might go more down a QI or improvement science road and end up with the same content. So one of the things I'd encourage you to do is think about the skills that you have, the skills that you want, what's available to you and to come up with a coherent program that makes sense for you and anchor less on what it's called and more on what it gives you. Yeah, I, I do. Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, that's certainly something that came up when we were thinking about this implementation science specialist training, you know, and a lot of nurses know a lot about quality improvement. And um, what's interesting is what what I took away from when we did that exercise, like Megan talked about, you know, what do you need that versus what do you have and what where's the gaps? What the big thing that I thought the implementation science practice added to what most people do in quality improvement is the linking of strategies with barriers and facilitators from a from a theoretical model. And that is a piece that as a lifelong QI practitioner, not lifelong, but long enough time to know that like it was tough and I was doing trial and error. And truthfully, um, I saw Hallie's question about IHI. If you look at the IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the guidance they suggest for how to do that, how to decide how to implement something is to do a bunch of PDSA cycles and the first word that they put on their model is hunches. And then they have theories and models, but hunches is the first word. And honestly, that's what a lot of us do in QI practice is to just like, well, this worked last time, let's try it again. Or I think this is the right thing here. And what I think that people who learned from our program really appreciated was now we know when we're gonna choose a strategy, we've chosen it for a reason. Like we're not just throwing the book at the problem and doing extra work and having those like, Cadillac interventions, if you will, with like all these things and the auditing and feedback and all the stuff we do, we're only doing those things if we know based on our, you know, analysis of the problem, the stakeholders and all that, that that's the strategy we need to use. So it's more efficient. And I think that's a piece that's always been missing in quality improvement. Um, it's more P trial and error, diagram it, PDSA cycles, and then get to the right thing. Potentially could save some time and, and resources if we got closer to the right thing first or earlier in the process with less PDSA cycles needed. I really like that, Amanda. And I, I almost um, uh, wonder um, uh, for me and others in our teaching and quality improvement, really, that's a good time to, to weave those concepts in, right? The, the defining and the diagnosing and the background and what's going on currently, like that's the same, right? right. That's, our, that's our current state, but it's really when you get to where do you where do you go next to test? So so I really like that connection that you just made. Yeah. I I do think it's probably worth bringing up thinking about the credential question again that the credential can be a little bit of a shortcut to I don't know that it's a shortcut to legitimacy but you know it does a little bit of work for you when you have those letters or you have that credential. And I think especially folks that come from potentially underrepresented or marginalized groups that having those that credential can do a little bit of work for you in terms of opening doors or making conversations a little bit easier to have. And I don't know that that's enough of a reason to go get a credential or to get a degree, but I might put it on the list of, of things to consider if you're deciding about a program. That it's nice to be able to say, look, I have this thing that you can point to that that demonstrates where some of my value is. Yeah. Sarah? Hi, um, I just wanted, and I, I know I'm meeting with you next week, so, but I, I'm, um, I figured I would share my question in case it was relevant for some other people. And I saw in the chat that it, there's at least a couple other students um, on the call. And so I'm wondering if there are, I know that there's like, tuition benefits for staff at CHOP or at Penn. Um, but if someone is like, for instance, I'm at my second year of, of my PhD. And so does my tuition benefits, because I can take classes across the G12, does that continue? Does that, 
kind of take care of some of the cost of the um, of the certificate, for instance. For the implementation science certificate, it does. So if you're a currently enrolled student at Penn, um, you can take courses within your program as long as they meet our requirements. They can sort of double count, so to speak, if you're a current student. If you're not a current student, it looks a little different. So reach out, but. And just to clarify, if we're taking classes in our program, does that mean we can also take classes like the ones that you absolutely okay cool. yep yep thank you sure anybody writing a k Um, I wonder if we want to go back to the question, Laura Ellen, I'm not sure if you're mm, busy sconing yeah. or not, but you had mentioned earlier, um, I think it was opportunity cost versus like financial cost and what what considerations you might think about when you're weighing different types of costs and choosing these programs, or if anyone else wanted to comment on that point either. Yeah, I can um, chime in here. So hi, everyone. My name is Laura Ellen Ashcraft. I'm an implementation scientist. Um, my training background is in social work, uh, all three degrees. Um, but and and so people think, oh, social work, how does that fit with implementation science? And what does that look like? And so I think something that Megan had mentioned early on, for me, what I realized, I got my master's degree and then worked in critical care research at Pitt for three years and realized for the things that I wanted to do, the things that I wanted to pursue in my own career. I needed those three little letters of having PhD after my name, um, in addition to all the training, but it was kind of a, you know, to Megan's point, right? It's a credentialing, but also an opportunity to really marinate in what are the theories of implementation science? What are those frameworks and how can we apply them in different ways? How can we think about measuring things equitably, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so some of the things that I really think about, especially when I'm talking with folks who are interested in implementation science, sometimes it's a cost thing, right? You know, to, to what uh, I think Megan had mentioned earlier, right? It can cost like $24,000, $25,000 to do something. And that's not a small amount of money. Um, certainly, you know, tuition benefits can, can help with that. But there's also the, the opportunity cost and thinking about what else could you be doing with your time, right? Versus you know, going full time into a PhD program or part time into a master's program. And uh, what, what we haven't had time to talk about today, but I think is really important are more of these apprenticeship mentorship programs. Um, and something that as a methodologist I am faced with is having to say no to people who want to collaborate. But I think there are so many opportunities of, um, you know, I would love to like work with people who are kind of newer to implementation science, have a little bit of a concept of kind of what research is generally, but are wanting to get more in the weeds with implementation science and collaborating with me and a PI on, on, a, on a project that may be of interest to them to really kind of think in an, in an experiential way about how do we apply these theories or how do we think about sustainability or uh, to the earlier point about dissemination, which happens to be one of my passions as well. So I, I think there are a lot of ways to approach this. And then uh, for me also just kind of getting some of those publications out in the you know implementation science journals um, and then having the confidence to say, I am an implementation scientist. I am confident in the way in which I apply theory and, and do these things. So I don't know if that answers the question, Izzy, or, or is helpful to folks, but I'm happy to talk to people. If, if people want to reach out, you know, Megan or, and Izzy can, can share my contact information. Yeah, happy to. I'd say one big takeaway from today should be feel free to reach out to folks. Um, to talk through some of the things that you're interested in, because everybody's situation is a little bit different and understanding what some of your options might be, who some of your mentors, potential mentors might be, is really important. So feel free to reach out to us. And, you know, we have a pretty broad network of folks. Oh, Anna has a K. <laughs> oh, good. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> there you are. 
Hi, uh, yeah. Well, I didn't want to interrupt anyone, but I just want to appreciate. I say I appreciate hearing these discussions because I'm kind of one of these awkward, um, like between fields people where I feel some growing pains. And so hearing how some of you guys have, you know, um, like you, Amanda, have gone from like a QI and how does that overlap with research and implementation science? Um, and also, I'm an epidemiologist by training, so. Um, kind of some of those overlaps with now we want to implement interventions. How do we actually study those things um, in, a, in a robust way? So uh, merging fields and uh, what training is necessary to be confident, like you said, uh, so that you can uh, do that uh, well. Awesome. Thank you. We're also working on putting together um, some more programming with some individuals who have kind of gone from more traditional fields like epi or global health or Megan and anesthesia, um, having some people come and talk about their transition into implementation science and how they've might married their training and traditional work and what their degree may have been in with kind of this newfound field of implementation science. So um, everyone is welcome to that session. Once we put out more information for it, you'll see it in the newsletter and you'll get an email about it. So something to look forward to. Thanks for bringing that up. We just have a couple of minutes left, so let's go ahead and adjourn because you know I'm sure a lot of you have things to follow and bio breaks are always welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We will make the content available and uh, good luck in everything. <laughs>